effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So if we think about it in the context of palliative care, um, an event could be a diagnosis of cancer. A series of event could be um, an ongoing illness for years or months, loss of a job. A series of events could be you're diagnosed with cancer, then you're um, not able to work, and then that results in financial distress where you lose um, a home. If you look at physically or emotionally harmful, it could be physical pain from loss of a limb in war or emotional pain from loss of a child or loss of multiple children and life-threatening. So really any event that's life-threatening, a serious illness is life-threatening, a car accident, um, genocide, those are just a few examples. So what do we mean when we talk about trauma-informed care? So trauma-informed care is an approach that assumes that an individual is more likely than not to have a history of trauma. Uh, trauma-informed care recognizes the presence of trauma symptoms and acknowledges the role that trauma may play in an individual's life. It's similar to a person and environment perspective, which is a core um, perspective for social work practice, which really talks about it's impossible for under us to understand an individual without understanding their environment and their life experiences. So trauma-informed care acknowledges the need to understand a patient's life and experiences in order to deliver effective care. It has the potential to improve engagement, treatment, adherence, and health outcomes. And one of the ways we could do this is, you know, a question I often like to ask is, tell me a little bit about yourself as a person. Because I find that if you say, tell me a little bit about bring, what brings you to clinic today, or tell me a little bit about what's going on, people automatically jump into sort of their medical diagnosis and what's happening medically. But if you say, tell me a little bit about yourself as a person, it allows somebody to sort of reflect on their life and what is important and what they're hoping they can um, continue to accomplish. And recognizing that you may not hear about uh, trauma experiences and initial visits, it often comes with over time and um, building trust and rapport. So what are some treatment challenges in palliative care? The, the main challenges that we have in palliative care when the taking a trauma-informed approach is limited time. We may only see patients once or twice. Um, also, just limited time that providers have in most clinic settings. Most traditional treatments for trauma need access to mental health providers, which is not always possible in clinics. And even with mental health providers, the best treatments for trauma-informed care, like, like PTSD, take 8 to 16 weeks. So like if you, um, some of the traditional treatments are uh, EMDR, which is eye movement decess desensitization and reprocessing or prolonged exposure therapy. And those are really mostly done in an outpatient mental health clinic that take a long time. And if you think about somebody who has a serious illness, they might not even have 16 weeks to go through these um, standardized treatments. And therapy sessions are 50 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes for severe trauma. And then there are um, other challenges are just the um, cost of the treatments and what providers, whether or not you have insurance or even access to pay for those treatments. So palliative care and trauma-informed um, care, really focusing on how within palliative care, illness can serve as the primary traumatic event like we talked earlier about a diagnosis of cancer or something we often see in a clinic setting here is a patient that might have heart failure and they're in the hospital frequently or they're getting um, maybe recurrent shocks from an um, ICD. And recurrent hospital stays for ongoing pain and treatment can also be very traumatic. And with past traumas like war or genocide, memories can be reactivated as patients enter the last phase of life or are diagnosed with a serious illness. So here is um, a patient case. And when we go through some ways to treat trauma, to take a trauma-informed um, approach with palliative care, we can think about um, 
this person. So 55 year old with a new diagnosis of ovarian cancer, um, reporting fear when trying to fall asleep at night and describes flashbacks and nightmares um, related to genocide and a history of abuse and has missed three of the last clinic appointments. So let's keep um, this patient in mind as we go through a way to take a trauma-informed um, approach. So where, where to start? You know, first recognize this is trauma and hearing the distressing memories, the intrusive thoughts, avoidance. A big thing is listening, making sure you're sitting down. Express empathy. Some statements you can use is, I can't imagine how difficult this must be. I can't imagine how scary and frightening this must be. And other signs and symptoms just to look for in a clinic setting would be negative mood and um, cognitions, like feeling of anger or guilt, negative self-beliefs, um, hyperarousal, which can show up in like anger, outbursts, or um, having a heightened startle response. And really thinking about within your clinic settings or where you're seeing patients, is there anything I can do to this environment to make things feel safer? And even asking that question, I recognize that you're going through a lot. I can't imagine how difficult this must be. Is there anything I can do to make things more comfortable when you come to clinic? So serious illness and post-traumatic stress disorder. So receiving a diagnosis of a life-limiting illness and experience relating symptoms like pain or shortness of breath can elicit feelings of helplessness that may be an index of a trauma or may trigger symptoms reminding one of previous trauma. And these are some ways that it can impact coping. So those living with trauma may be prone to avoidant coping strategies, so remaining like physically or mentally occupied. So an example would be if I had a previous trauma and one of my ways to cope would always be running daily. And that was what had helped me cope for, let's say, you know, 10 or 15 years. And then I was diagnosed with a serious illness that took away my ability to engage with that coping strategy. Then that is one way that my coping can be impacted and potentially then trigger past traumas. Medical decision-making is another um, thing to be aware of, the anxiety and emotional challenges that accompany trauma and serious illness can impact a patient's ability to make decisions. It can impact their thought process, their family relationships. So it can often be good in, if it's possible and it, with the patient's permission to include family in medical decision-making. Functional decline that often happens with serious illness it can lead to being reliant on others for personal care, and that sometimes can exacerbate trauma system, symptoms. So let's say that one of my coping strategies was to have time alone and isolate from people. And now I'm not able to do that anymore because with my illness, I have to be more dependent on others for care. And that can then re-trigger um, past traumas. And medication, so to be aware of like medications that have um, sedative properties like benzodiazepines may precipitate intrusive thoughts or hyperarousal. So be mindful when prescribing. And then um, when we're looking at physical pain and physical pain, um, really you can have this sort of dual relationship where um, pain influences PD, PTSD symptoms and vice versa. So an example would be physical pain might precipitate in these intrusive memories, which then amplifies and increases the pain. And some patients welcome pain relieving measures or seek out um, you know, pain management on their own. And for others, um, pain may be tolerated as a form of suffering. And that is something to explore. So it's crucial to explore PTSD with both the individual relationship with pain and with each individual patient. These are sort of guidelines, not necessarily occurs in, in everybody. Oh. 
Okay, so the stepwise psychosocial palliative care approach was developed by David Feldman in 2017, and there's an article at the end of this in the references. And what this approach does, because of the limited time with palliative care, it's a three-stage process. So step one is the pal to palliate immediate discomfort and provide social supports. So this can only be done by treating physical pain and developing a trusted relationship by actively listening and assess the patient's sense of safety. So we're not gonna be able to explore trauma um, or build a trusting relationship with somebody who's in physical pain. So the first step is immediately to palliate the discomfort. Um, always ask permission in developing this trusting relationship by actively listening, asking permission to enter the room. Um, do not, um, if, if you're in an inpatient setting, do not wake a patient who is soundly sleeping expressing empathy, and if possible, adjust changes to the physical environment. So for example, if you are in an acute care setting that often can be very loud, if someone's triggered by loud noises or an inability to see a door or an exit way, you can try transferring the patient to a different room where it's less noisy or making sure that they are in a private room if that's possible. And then step two is providing psychoeducation to enhance coping skills. So people with a history of trauma often feel sort of out of control, and it can be helpful to provide education about medication, care plans, and the dying process. And then also teaching patients coping skills. So this can be done with simple breathing exercises and relaxation training that can be done in a clinic setting. And it could even be just as simple as um, something that we have done in our clinic here can just um, be something as simple as like uh, smelling the roses. So like a breathing technique of breathing in to like smell flowers or smell roses and, and blowing out like if you're blowing out a candle. And that can just be something simple or on the in-breath. Sometimes people teach to say, I am like on your in-breath and then on your out-breath at peace. And that can be something that then patients can take home with them to practice in their own environment. And then finally, the last stage. So again, this is a very easy kind of three-step process that um, Feldman teaches around um, the approach to trauma-informed care is treating specific trauma issues. So the most important thing to note here is that you can't really move to this stage um, until the earlier interventions have alleviated those, those presenting symptoms. So if somebody is in a lot of pain, you can't really move to treating these specific trauma um, issues until those stages are complete. So if someone has a prognosis of years, you can refer to mental health providers for long-term therapy. Again, therapies like EMDR, which take longer, but if somebody has years to live, you can make referrals out. If there's no access to mental health providers, you can focus on supportive care, active listening, providing a non-judgmental presence, and really building trust and, trust and rapport over time. And also that is specific for people who have a, a shorter prognosis. I wanted to just go back quickly now that we have gone over that to the patient um, that I brought up. And I'm wondering sort of knowing that three-step process that we just outlined, people can put in the chat um, or if you have thoughts about, you know, if this was somebody that was coming to your clinic in that first visit, how you might best support her from a trauma-informed care approach. I don't know if there's other questions. I'm gonna look at the chat and see if there's any other questions that have come in, but you're welcome to either unmute yourself or just put some questions in the chat. Or any general questions you might have. I know this was a lot of information we went over in 20 minutes, so we can have. And thinking about this, and if I was hearing this information before she came to clinic, I would be mindful of, you know, 
and, and sort of exploring um, what the fear around trying to fall asleep. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Do you have trouble then staying asleep? And really in that first visit, focusing on you know building um, trust and rapport and creating a safe environment and exploring what might help her, if we're, I'm gonna go back to stage one here, what might help her um, feel safe also exploring whether or not there's a lot of physical discomfort, because if there's physical discomfort with pain, then maybe involving a physician or nursing colleagues that might be able to help treat that pain first before moving on to treat the trauma symptoms. Okay, so someone put in, yeah, start building trust. Yep, these are all great. Assess for acute issues such as pain, yep, safety, and then seeing what support she has. I love that. Also exploring like who, who helps support you at home? Who are your resources at home? Maybe seeing if there's somebody that can bring her to clinic. If there's an ability to have some kind of um, outreach to, uh, to see if there's barriers um, you know, just physical barriers for her coming to clinic that maybe you might be able to assess over the phone first. Okay, so someone else put in here, yep, establish rapport and trust using ep empathetic responses. Inquire about physical symptoms first. Yeah, great. These are all, these are all great thoughts. Sometimes it can be helpful to just even have somebody um, to talk about what they're aware of in their body. So if you're talking about, um, oh, somebody just put that in there, Susan. Yes, look at body, uh, yeah, body language. So body language, whether or not somebody is, has their arms crossed. Um, I also think it's important if you're exploring some of the questions you might ask about having, once you've built trust and rapport, if she's having trouble falling asleep at night, you could ask, well, what do you notice is happening in your body when you're having trouble falling asleep? That sometimes helps to say like, is my heart racing? Um, am I feeling physical pain? Um, or is it that I have these thoughts that are racing that I'm worried that something's gonna happen or I'm worried that I'm you know, gonna have to go to the hospital or I'm worried that I'm dying? Okay, someone has their hand up. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. Um, even as you look at this case study, uh, I've liked what you've talked about. Uh, one of the ask questions to ask a patient talking about tell me about yourself. I think that's a very, very important uh, aspect because most of the time, uh, when you see patients at the facility, we already give them uh, the, the sick role. Uh, this is a patient and they take it up. Um, uh, like definitely, but when you look at telling, asking someone to tell them to tell them about themselves, it's like you're looking at a person as a holistic person, because most of the time I find that uh, I'm imagining with the trauma it might not even be the health condition which has brought them mm -hmm. to the hospital, which is the main issue at that moment. They may be having other issues or other traumas, as you mentioned, which can come from uh, maybe past experiences. So that really opens a way for the person to, to tell you what is most important to them at that moment. So I think that's a very good point I've learned. So I wanted to find out um, in cases, for example, where um, you experience someone who has had trauma, but um, the reaction is pathological. Okay, they're not reacting in the, in the normal way you'd expect, maybe to reason and identify, maybe having a trusted relationship, Maybe like you have had cases where people say that this person maybe is a, maybe someone is on denial or someone is um, uh, being maybe uh, violent. Any, any, any reaction that is, is, is pathological, how does that work in such a case where someone is traumatized and they're reacting quite in a pathological way and you may not have that, uh, that forum where you can reason together? What happens in such a case? Thank you. 
you know, so you're asking like if somebody is very angry or is having sort of anger outbursts and they come to your to clinic. Yes, and maybe when you when you when you want to talk to them and is maybe for example you ask a question and the next thing you receive is a slap or something like that. I've had such cases where you maybe yeah. So what how, how do we manage? Because of course the trauma can be very overwhelming and people can react in different ways. So how would you anticipate such cases where uh, the person may react in a way that you do not anticipate or in a way that is I'll call it pathological. I, I'm sure there's a better word, but just allow me to use that. Uh, just yeah. to show that it's not the normal way you would expect. And maybe you can advise us on the right way to call such a scenario. Thank you. So there's a lot of a lot of great things in the chat about building rapport and encourage. Um, exploring what has helped people cope in the past. I think to answer your question, if somebody is really having kind of an anger outburst, the most important thing to do first is being aware of what's happening in your own nervous system and your own body, because oftentimes if somebody comes in or if they're yelling, then we'll sort of be heightened. And if you, if you can settle yourself first to take a breath and you can acknowledge, um, it sounds, you know, help me understand. I can see that you're very upset. Help me understand how I can help. And sometimes those statements then can, can help de-escalate somebody before, and then you can move on to exploring whether or not, like, are they having a lot of pain? Were they frustrated because it took a while to get this appointment or it took them a long, you know, time to get here, or they don't, they didn't have any resources to help with coping. Um, I'm just reading uh, some of the other questions in the chat. Does that help answer your question? I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can see each other and have a conversation about this um, before we move on to the case. Does that help answer your question? Yes, yes it does, yeah. The one being aware, yes, it does. There's also another comment, I think an addition to the question, which is saying also being aware that in some cultures, elders will not always be forthright in talking about pain, physical or uh -huh. psychological. Yeah, yeah. And then another one is saying you should, you should calm the patient and don't approach him or her until he becomes, okay, maybe he becomes calm or something. So those are the, the, some coming on the chat. Thank you, I'm looking for other questions. Uh, thank you so much, Anne, for the presentation. Yeah, it's you're really, welcome. It's really, really yeah. eye-opening. And um, uh, as you've mentioned, it's uh, trauma comes in many forms and it's important mm -hmm. to, it's really important for us to, to learn how to approach uh, uh, such cases and how to uh, address that. So I'm looking at the, uh, the chat or anyone who has a question or an addition. Please, you can raise your hand, or you can um, you can put your question in the chat or a comment. This is the time. Is your experience uh, where maybe you've had such a case where you uh, taken care of a patient who had uh, who had uh, trauma and how that went through. So there's a comment also here by Duke to say that you should build good relationship with patients and family and as well as counseling. Yeah. Um, so there's a question um, which is asking that people in uh, traumatic uh, by Susan, people in traumatic uh, settings usually have lost much of their power and autonomy. So how do we return the power to them? 
want to um yeah, I think that's often how over time too, with somebody who has a serious illness, how they lose a lot of their autonomy and their control and having to be dependent on others. And I think exploring ways that we can create a safe environment for them to, to see us and then exploring ways that they might be able to gain some of that um, autonomy back, whether it's not, you know, it, it might not all be possible but what continues to within the context of their illness, you know, um, ways that they're able to cope and what brings them joy. I think I put that question in there too. And also just acknowledging and creating a safe environment for them of how um, it's, it's so great that you came here today and acknowledging with so many, you know, often medical appointments being a, a positive place where, you know, rather there's often, um, you know, just what it takes to get to an appointment is a lot. So it's great that you showed up today. I'm so happy to see you. Oh. Can help create that supportive, nurturing environment. Okay, thank you so much. Um, then there's another, um, I think, addition by Sin Liu. He's saying that um, often he finds it very helpful to be aware of what's going within within themselves to acknowledge one's feeling and the needs, as you mentioned. And then it was, it was also added that uh, staying present with the client and being there, just giving the person a company is very essential and a part of support and care by itself. So you may not necessarily have to talk or say anything, but just the presence is also an important aspect of, of that. Um, maybe, it's, maybe you could say something about that or add to that, and the power of presence Mm -hmm. And somebody said like explaining a safe environment. So that's a good question because um, I think that goes along to stay, staying present. So I think you can explore. So let's say we use that example of the patient who had missed three clinic visits and help me understand what is the best, because that's, that's an individual thing of, you know, I guess creating a safe environment. While one thing might work for somebody where they, somebody might prefer to meet with, if you have an interdisciplinary team in your clinic, somebody might prefer to meet with multiple people at one time, while somebody else just might feel safer to meet with one person, or it might feel safer for that person to, um, you know, meet outside and not, in the, or it might feel safer if that person is able to sit closer to the door. It might feel safer if the door is not closed. So you can explore that of help me understand what would make you feel safe in coming to our clinic. Does that answer your question, Susan? Okay, thank you. I will wait for Susan to give the feedback. Okay. So there's a, uh, I'm trying to catch I up on all the other. Yes, yeah, so there's a, another question mm -hmm. uh, that some people may not be able to describe their pain and where exactly the pain is. And this is very common. You find someone will come and say, I feel pain all over. It's on my body, it's on my head, it moves down. So they're not able to describe uh, the pain and where exactly it is. So how can we handle such? Or how can we handle that? I can, um, I can, I think, so if somebody says I have pain all over, sometimes I might ask, is it worse in one place than another? Well, yeah, it's worse in my head. And then if you can ask, well, can you describe it and maybe give some words? Like, does it feel burning? Does it feel stabbing? Does it feel sh like a shooting pain? That can help to be able to give people some words. Sometimes other pat patients, like you can even ask, like, does the pain have a color to it? How does, you know, um, if somebody's describing like, well, I have pain in my lower back, can you point to where it is in your lower back? Does it ever go away? Are there ever dur times during the day where it feels better or where it feels worse? And, and maybe giving some sensation words so they can describe what it feels like. But it can be hard because it can be, oh, go ahead, Jesse. Go ahead, Dr. No, Jesse. I was gonna say, I that I really love what Anne said and I do all those same things and I'll introduce myself in a second. I didn't uh, at the beginning, but I'm Dr. Jesse. Um, and I, I think that is a really common issue just to say 
first and really hard because it's really hard to figure out exactly what to do. And we're always thinking about medications. One of the things I think about is that sometimes that is diagnostic of there being more things impacting their pain than just their physical experience. Not mm -hmm. always, but it's mm -hmm. one of those cues to me to think what else is going on with this patient that isn't just their physical pain. Um, and obviously most of these patients have real physical pain. And then I also think what else is happening in their life? What else is happening socially? What is, else is happening emotionally? What else is happening with their family? What else is happening with their feelings about um, God and where they're going to go after they may die. Um, what else is happening about their fears? And sometimes when there's other things going on, that seems to cause for a lot of patients the inability to sort of place a pain because their pain is really multiple things, right? It's social pain, it's emotional pain, it's that existential pain of purpose and meaning. Um, and, and why this has happened to me and why God has done this to me. Um, and so I tend to think of it a little bit diagnostic too, where I'm thinking, aha, have I missed something else that I can think about? Because sometimes it's medications and sometimes it's not medications that I need to be thinking about to work on their pain. Thank you so much, Dr. Jesse, for the submission. Uh, Susan has mentioned that she, uh, she, was, she was answered, so that's great. So I have another comment uh, about uh, still under the patient. Uh, try to calm them down while everyone is judging them. Show them that it is okay to react that way. But again, through counseling, you can help them handle situations. And also having the relatives understand the patient's side situation. Then we have also a comment from Nalubega, who, who says that in most of in most 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 of the people with undescribable body pains there's probably an underlying psychological problem. Just saying what Dr. Jesse has mentioned, try to probe more, they may have even uh, depression. Then uh, I just want to add another experience. I think from my experience, at the time, uh, there was a mother in a ward, uh, the mother had a patient with cancer and she had gone through quite a lot of trauma, uh, the child going and, and diagnosis and the rest. And it was, there was a doctor who was seeing this mother. So this doctor had seen this mother so many times. So there's a, now the next time when the doctor came to see the mother, the doctor asked the mother the name again. So what's your name again? And the mother was very angry and gave, gave, him, gave him a slap. But it's also just for us uh, as, as healthcare workers, when you're taking care of someone who has undergone through trauma, yeah, we, before we go and see the patient, it's good to, to, to be up to date with the history, the name of the person, calling the person by name, you know, those, those small things which show that uh, I acknowledge you, I've been with this journey with you, especially if it's a patient or someone whom we have seen more than one time, going back and saying, what was your name again? What was the problem again? I think can also bring in um, those reactions which we are talking about. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you so much. I think um, uh, there are no other uh, active chats. But you're welcome at any point in time. If you have a question or a comment, you are welcome to just add it in and we'll sure make sure that uh, we don't miss it. Then the chats are just uh, people accepting and introducing themselves, Mohammed and the rest, you're welcome. So thank you so much. So we finished the first session uh, on the question answer from the presentation. So we are moving next to a case study, which I think will trigger more ideas and more discussion. And the case study is going to be presented by Dr. Jesse Humphreys. So Dr. Jeffrey, you are welcome to present. And after the case studies, we'll continue with questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much and good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Um, I'm in California right now. So around 6 a.m. ish in the morning. So you saw my baby quickly. It was nursing time in the morning to hand him off to my husband, but I am a doctor in California, in the United States. I'm at uh, UCSF, so I'm an assistant clinical professor there. And I also am the chief of palliative care at one of our veterans associations. So one of our VA hospitals that really takes care of veterans coming back from 
um, war and being placed in various places in the country. Um, I also do some side work in asylum evaluation, so people who are seeking asylum, um, and I also help run a, uh, for the United States, fellows in palliative care, a global palliative fellowship, so people will get to go and do a little bit of work um, in Uganda and in India sometimes, and then I am have been incredibly humbled and lucky to do some work in Uganda and Kenya in the past, um, largely in palliative care and hospice these days. Um, and then I also do some work in our indigenous population um, here in the United States. We have sort of Indian health services, um, but, but people who were here in the United States before um, people came to the country um, and they have very different experiences of healthcare and a lot of um, variable access to resources too. So all of those things include trauma. A lot of the work that I do is in trauma in many different settings with many different populations. So I've done a lot of thinking about how to think about trauma and palliative care and how to integrate that into the way that um, way that I practice. And right now I do exclusively palliative care, although I'm internal medicine and palliative care trained. And today um, we're really gonna talk about a couple of cases, two cases, and we're really gonna try to apply everything that Anne already so beautifully talked about, um, thinking about the most important thing in trauma-informed care is to be informed about trauma. So to be thinking initially about what causes trauma for these patients, is there trauma going on with patients? And we, we think actually, if you look at the stats that there's actually a very high percentage of patients, especially in healthcare that are traumatized, that have a history of trauma. And that's in part because healthcare itself, the experience of being in the healthcare system often triggers trauma as Anne mentioned. And also many of our patients have gone through completely other experiences um, that uh, result in trauma experiences as well. So we're gonna think about what causes trauma. We're also gonna think about what are they experiencing as emotions? Because trauma does not impact everyone the same. Trauma does not impact everyone the same. Some people come out with completely different emotional experiences and that experience of trauma may present in an entirely different way. You may see that as anger. You may see that as grief and sadness, um, and it may look different to different people. So it can be hard sometimes to pick up on. So we're gonna think about that a little bit and then talk about some of the applied approaches that Anne talked about too. Um, and during this time, I absolutely will have you guys jump into the chat and start sharing things in the chat. So I'll let you know, but have that ready. We'll love to get your thoughts. So we'll start with the first case. Um, first case is a, a young woman, 32 years old with uh, CA cervix. Um, and she has pretty severe bone pain um, and she's getting IV morphine. Just, just a minute, Jesse. Yeah. And the slides, it's okay. you can put the presentation mode so that it can move. Oh, you're not seeing that? Okay, go ahead. Let me switch. I'm going to switch my sharing method. This happens sometimes. Yes. Um, if I share yes. it to my desktop, then I can. Um... Yes, now you can see the slides and they're moving. Great. Yeah. Great, excellent. Thank you. Here are the key questions, yeah. Um, so 32 year old CA cervix, severe bone pain with IV morphine right now. So our, our patient here is married. She's got a four year old son. Um, her husband has left her since she's been diagnosed. Um, she stays right now in the refugee camp uh, with her mother who is elderly and her younger sister and her brother. And her younger sister is taking care of her child. Her brother stays with her in the hospital. And you hear from nurses as you're sort of going to see this patient that she's frequently screaming out, crying. Um, she wants to leave the hospital, but she has a lot of pain. And right now she can only get that IV morphine while she's admitted to the hospital. The patient and her brother were recently informed about the diagnosis and prognosis. Uh, they were told that there wasn't a cure and that she would ultimately die of this. She, she did report maybe to one of the nurses, maybe not to you quite yet, um, that, uh, that being in the hospital brings back really strong memories of attacks when she was in Somalia and that some of the hospital guards remind her of armed forces. And she also may feel differently about female providers versus male providers. And so some of the male providers may be really scary and triggering to her. And then in particular at night when it's dark and she can't see things, um, she may feel really out of control and the pain gets a lot worse and she's crying, hitting her bed. I first want to pause. I'm going to pull up the chat so I can see what you guys are saying. Um, you know, what causes trauma for this patient? So you heard about lots of different things in her life, but type in some things you think might be 
might or might have caused trauma for her. Past experience in Somalia, absolutely. Be one more thing. Yeah, the hospital environment, right? The hospital environment being really constraining. Just the pain experience, yep, absolutely. All of her medical issues, including her pain, I see family. The loss of autonomy, that is huge. That is huge for sure. And her husband is left, absolutely. That feeling of isolation. So you're exactly right um, about all those things. In fact, I think you 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 captured a lot of those ones. I see a yeah, loss of marriage, um, being away from her child. Absolutely. Um, we know that being in healthcare in and of itself, experience illness can cause trauma. You know, being in pain, being in a situation where you feel like you don't have control over your own body and life um, can be hugely traumatizing. Um, and then she, exactly as you said, she has she has prior experience as well. Um, so in Somalia, she experienced and witnessed violence and rape, and those things can absolutely come up. Those sort of those sort of fears, those perseverative thoughts, those nightmares, all those things are probably occurring for her, especially at night, but in the hospital. Um, you guys identified just in incredible losses, right? She's she's already thinking about and grieving in the future her own death, but she currently has already lost a husband. She's missing her son, not being there. And I will say that one thing that I've learned a lot in doing trauma work now um, as a as a mom, I have I have two little boys, a six month old and a almost three year old. And I think so much more um, than I used to before I had children about the incredible impact of of being away from your children and also thinking about leaving your children. But that can cause huge amounts of trauma as well. And just the loss of support, you know, her mother maybe being her primary support and not and her sister um, and not being with them nightmares and bad experiences. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. And then just fears about the future, you know, all of this, all of this anticipating um, scary things in the future as well. So next question for you guys to type into the chat, what are some of the emotions you're seeing her experience? They can help to put a name to things. Anger, I see anger, absolutely. Grief, mm -hmm. fear, that's a really important one to identify. Worry, fear can come out as anger. You know, that happens with, with kids, with little kids too, when they're scared sometimes, right? They, come, they act angry um, and that's true for all people. Uncertainty, yeah, this unpredictability. Sometimes not knowing is, is even harder than knowing something bad. And that's actually especially true for people who've experienced trauma the uncertainty, the not knowing can be even scarier than knowing something bad will happen. Worry, anxiety, I see anxious, fear of unknown, anger again, yes, absolutely. Those are exactly right. And I see guilt, guilt actually is a huge one. Absolutely, could be guilt that she's not there with her mother, could be guilt that she's not there with her son, could be guilt that she did something wrong that she caused this for herself guilt that she is responsible for husband leaving absolutely so last question here what can we as healthcare providers do to help i know ann really beautifully highlighted so many different sorts of things but what are some of the things that you're thinking about in this particular case i think sure? building Oh, yeah, I was going to say building trust. And if there's any way to have access to mental health providers, which I know is not always possible, or spiritual care providers. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Anne talked a lot about counseling and I, and I see Maduri noting that as well, but absolutely. Psychosocial. Yep. Both an assessment, just hearing and talking to her about that, getting information, validating her experience. Huge. Maybe the number one counseling, providing emotional support. Pain management, absolutely. You know, going back to all the other things that we know make trauma experiences, make suffering worse, trying to work on some of the other core things. Yeah, how is her pain managing? Don't get tired of listening to her. Yeah. Sometimes these emotions can feel sort of repetitive because they're that's what they're doing to people's bodies. They're sort of, you know, anger and anger and fear and fear are staying, staying there and, and uh, us being present, being fully present, 100%. Yeah, just love, just your presence normalizing 
yeah, normalizing these experiences, people can feel really isolated in the feelings that they're experiencing. They can, they can feel isolated. They feel like they're the only ones who are feeling scared or lost um, and just normalizing that actually this is really common. It's really common for people to be traumatized by being in the hospital for things in the past to be brought up that is really common. Um, and they are, they are having a hard experience, but it is also a normal, it is a common experience. And then post-traumatic stress counseling, absolutely. Wonderful. I think you guys really, really highlighted all of these things. Um, a lot of people said sort of staying present, being present with her, um, not being scared away by her suffering. I think that's actually one of the core interventions for trauma. Um, it's, it's, it, it's hard because on the one hand, you know, there, there are some things we can do to try to make things better. But mostly, mostly our intervention is to just be present with people. Mostly it's not that we're going to fix, we're not going to fix the fact that she experienced horrific things in the past. We're not gonna fix the fact that she's dying. We're not gonna fix the fact that she's going to be away from her son and leave her son ultimately. But we can be present with her in some of that suffering. And to be honest, that is, that is often the best thing that we can do as humans in healthcare um, and particularly for trauma as well. So sitting and listening, asking her to share. I think a lot of people are scared. Like a lot of people in her life are scared of the suffering. They're scared to hear someone say, I don't wanna leave my son. You know, those are hard things to sit with, to hear. And sometimes you as a provider may be the only one who can hear those things, who can sit and allow people to really share um, open, honestly, I see Susan saying open, honest rapport and Amanda are speaking to her way of understanding. Absolutely. So expressing empathy and already highlighted that, but some specific language. Um, I, I try to stay away from anything like I understand or um, it's going to get better. It's going to be fine um, because it isn't going to be fine, right? It's not going to be fine, but honoring how she's feeling. So you're really saying this is so hard. This is so scary for you. It is so hard to be away from your son, to be away from your family, you know, without trying to fix, without trying to, you know, try to make that go away, but just really honoring the way that she's feeling and sitting with that. That is the hardest thing and sometimes one of the most important things to do. And then we heard as well and, and talked about changing the environment. So that can be changing the environment in the hospital, you know, is there a place, a way she can feel a little safer in the hospital, right? Can she have female providers at night? Could she be in a, a bed that feels safer? And just asking her what would make you feel safer here. I think that was an excellent thing to think about. But then thinking about the environment overall, not just sort of here while she's in the hospital, but could she be cared for at home? Is there a way? And maybe really hard if people are choosing between adequate pain management and being at home, um, as we know they often, often are um, all over the world but thinking about are there ways to change the environment more globally for her. Um, so really, I think thinking about it, and we really just talked through this, but doing the things to develop a trusting relationship, and that's really by being present, by listening, expressing empathy. And the way that I like to do that is to name emotions, name what's going on, um, reflect back what's going on, respect what's going on without trying to fix, without trying to make go away. Um, and then thinking about what we can do to the actual physical environment to try to, to help things be um, as good as they can be or a little bit better. And then thinking about what else we can do to help her coping, right? So there's certainly all of the being present. And then sometimes there are things we can do to help things be a little bit better. Again, not fixing, right? We're not going to fix the fact that this is going on, but are there things we can do that help give her a little bit more um, coping and a little bit more strength? Um, to be able to get through this. So I wanted to actually um, stop here and do one of, do a, and actually highlighted some of the things she, she does as well and they do in their clinic, but I wanted to do one of the relaxation or breathing exercises here that we do with patients very quickly. Um, so if I can have everyone where you are, if you're sitting, go ahead and try to seat. Um, and if it serves you, you can go ahead and close your eyes. And I just want you to feel, feel your feet on the ground, if they're on the ground. Feel your sit bones on the chair, if they're on the chair. Feel your hands on your lap, if they're on your lap. And I just want you to take a few deep breaths. So deep breath in, feeling the air fill your lungs. 
and then breathe out. When you're breathing out, feel the air sort of going into the back of your ankles. And then breathe out into the back of your knees. And breathe into your lower back. And breathe out into your lower back. Feel the air filling your lungs and then breathe out into your shoulders. And one last breath, breathing in, breathing out into your wrists. If your eyes are closed, you can go ahead and open them and come back. There are many different sorts of breathing exercises, but the core goals of some of these are to really bring people back into their present space. Sometimes people are in a different space. You know, they're imagining other things, they're being traumatized by other things and bringing them back into their own physical experience, whether that's doing a, a very mini version of what I did, a body scan where you're sort of receding into portions of your body um, or whether it's um, touching things around you and having people focus on what they're feeling in their, in their space or whether it's looking around the room and naming things, but bringing people back into their current physical space um, and even just anything that gets them focusing on their breath. Um, as Anne mentioned, it can be just as, as simple as taking a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Um, I do that with my toddler all the time when he's uh, also really anxious and, and losing it for a variety of reasons. So we'll move into the second case. Um, the second case is, um, it's gonna actually be this, this child's father, but uh, we'll talk first about the child. So a six-year-old who has um, advanced retinoblastoma spread at least to the orbital bones and we think probably brain mets at this point in time um, pretty severe bone pain um, with headaches uh, is on um, by mouth morphine as well as dexamethasone, both of which are helping. And the father's with the child at the hospital. Um, the father has been talking a lot about um, taking a child to the referral hospital as someone told him there's a doctor who can help his child. The mother's at home with three other young children. Um, and recently um, there's a motorcycle accident, not with this child, but with a separate child. Um, and the father was in a motorcycle accident with a two-year-old. And so the son um, was actually hospitalized for a while, um, has permanent injuries, um, is unable to walk and to stop talking. Um, father has since recovered. Um, but during that time, this child um, is one of his daughters and her eyes started swelling during this time. Um, they were unable to take her to the hospital because he was so sick. Um, and the father now who you're seeing in the hospital is having trouble sleeping, seems very upset each night in the hospital. When his staff tried to talk to him, he's really struggling to even answer or speak. Um, and, uh, and part of that is a little bit language barrier, but part of that is just he's having a hard time expressing himself. So one of the Somali speaking staff is, is able to learn after sitting with him for a little bit and getting um, some of just the information about what's going on with him, was able to learn that the father is having some flashbacks from when he himself is in the hospital after the accident and actually having maybe flashbacks of the accident as well. So I think we're gonna think now actually as the, as the, the father as our patient, even though obviously one of the patients is the child um, in our care, but I often think very much as all of the people as my patients. So my, my patients are my patients, their family members, my patients. And I actually think a lot about the team as my patients as well. So uh, everyone else in healthcare thinking about them kind of broadly as, as all patients too. So first, if you can just type in what causes trauma for this patient? What are some of the things that are triggering? This is for the father. Being back in the hospital, absolutely. Guilt, hugely. Yeah, guilt, guilt about, maybe guilt about the two-year-old in the motorcycle accident, maybe guilt about the six-year-old who, you know, they didn't bring to the hospital back then um, because he was so sick through no fault of his own. Yeah, the accident he experienced, the actual traumatic accident, absolutely. Um, and now having a child with permanent injury, self-blame. Yeah, feeling of being, yeah, absolutely. Feeling of powerlessness, of not being able to control things. The flashback, yeah, anger that the accident happened to him. This loss of power, being away from the rest of his family, right? Not being able to be with his other kids and his wife. And just, there's nothing like having a sick child. Um, yeah, 
and traumatic experience. Absolutely. I think you guys really highlighted a lot of this, but the guilt, um, uh, multiple forms of guilt um, absolutely are probably impacting him dramatically. Uh, loss of support, right? His main support isn't there and he's having to be so support, right? For one of his kids. Um, and also he's, um, he's, he himself is, is struggling to not have support. Um, previous experiences, maybe he also had experiences in the past, um, experience witnessing violence. And then some, some huge fears about his child's future, about pain, suffering at the end of life. And I think I already saw some emotions highlighted here, but any other emotions I hear, um, maybe some worry, absolutely. I saw anger. I think I saw self-blame, guilt, uh, maybe depression, PTSD. Some of the symptoms that come with PTSD being anxiety, being fear. Anything else? Dad. Inability to cope powerlessness. Powerlessness is one of the most powerful, powerful, horrific um, things to feel and very triggering, very triggering to people who um, were in traumatic experiences. There's, there's a, you know, we heard Anne talk about a definition, but one of the core elements of traumas, right? Because people go through challenging things all the time. Some people come out of challenging things really traumatized and some people come through challenging things with not as much trauma. But one of the characteristics of a traumatic experience is not feeling in control. That is one of the core requirements for traumatic experience. Um, and some people can go through the same sort of hard things and feel more in control or less control. And oftentimes someone who went through a traumatic experience with little control actually results in more long lasting trauma. And then lastly, to kind of think about some of the things we can do, what are some of the things that we as healthcare providers can do kind of applying, applying the approach that, that Anne highlighted for us? with his father, some things we might be able to do for him. Acknowledge his emotions, absolutely. Sometimes we, sometimes people don't tell us, but we can take a guess at them, you know, at what, what we're seeing, validating, normalizing, naming, absolutely. Um, naming people guilt in particular can be so powerful. People feel so, they feel so guilty about feeling guilty. You know, they feel like it's this incredible, horrific secret that is awful. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, everyone will think the worst of them if they express, you know, the, their own guilt at things and sometimes normalizing and naming, you know, it's really common to feel guilty about this. Um, it's, it's hugely powerful counseling. Yep. Pain management, pain management in particular suffer, you know, in the hospital. Um, absolutely. And sometimes that can be, you know, really ameliorating and better for his suffering too. Yep pain medication, mm -hmm. compassion and support, counseling for him too, you know, thinking about how to, how to provide counseling for family members. Again, not necessarily something available for everyone, but hugely beneficial. Um, and, and kids, kids are smart. As you guys know, kids, um, things do not escape them. You know, a six-year-old is going to see, she's going to know her father's suffering. She's going to, um, she's going to feel that, you know, oftentimes kids are really, really astute and can tell um, how much their, their parents may be struggling. They often, you know, kids often know that they're, they're dying um, in a way, not long before their parents necessarily, but they often, you know, will say to me, if I see a, a young kid, um, you know, don't, don't tell my mom I'm dying. I know that I know that I am. Um, and, uh, but she may be seeing that suffering and that can make it harder sometimes for, for kids as well. Yeah, looking into support system. So what else can we do to support him? Yeah, and make sure you know what the patient's likes and dislikes. Who are, who are they as a person? One of the core elements of trauma is dehumanization. Is, is making people feel like they are not humans, making people feel that they are not, um, you know, in control, but making them feel dehumanized. And so to rehumanize people is actually one of the huge interventions for trauma. You know, how do I make you feel like a human, like an individual person that has an individual story? Um, that is a huge, huge part of the, of the interventions. 
So absolutely recognizing first that this is trauma. That is the number one task. If you only do that, that is, that is actually quite good. Sending and listening to a story, absolutely hearing more. Again, trying to express empathy. I saw all those great responses about normalizing, honoring those emotions, saying it is really hard. It's really hard to see your daughter in pain. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to have a son at home who's really injured now and not able to talk. This is so scary for you. Um, and then again, thinking about applying sort of our approach, how can we change the environment? And is this, a, is this a child who could be cared for at home? Is there a way that we could do that? And then thinking more broadly, is there anything particularly re-traumatizing or triggering about this environment that may be really difficult for the father? So again, thinking about developing that trusting relationship. Yeah, and I see in the chat here, giving them back as much power as possible. So that's actually an excellent point, highlighting what are the things you can be in control of. It may be very small, but giving people control of something in the hospital. You know, maybe it's, you know, having the father help decide kind of when the pain medication for his child was scheduled. So that can be really helpful. You know, if he's really picking up on things and feeling like there's, you know, not as good pain control at night or whatever it is, having him have some input and say, um, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something else about the evenings or, um, or something and giving people power back can be really, really, really powerful. Men tend to solve problems, understanding what he really wants what he really wants to settle or to solve and provide service, support. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's such a human quality. We, we want to fix things, right? We want to fix things and make them better. Um, and our job is to oftentimes recognize that that's fixing overall is impossible um, and really trying to sit with some things that are hard. And on the other hand, also thinking that there are some things we can fix, right? Or at least make better. We may be able to make his, his child's pain better and we can try to actually do that. There may be concrete things that he feels like could be fixed in the inpatient setting, in the hospital setting, um, and really trying to think and ask about those things. I think you guys really highlighted some of these things too. And then, you know, we can teach coping skills to, um, to kids. And, you know, we can also teach coping still skills to parents and to family members too. Um, and a lot of our work around grief and bereavement is, um, is thinking about that too. How do we sort of frame uh, our family members as patients as well? And then I wanted to just highlight really quickly, because a lot of the work I do in trauma is in caring for teams, caring for providers who are actually out um, doing work in traumatic situations and being traumatized um, by their work uh, and having something called vicarious trauma, which is when you are close to patients or people who are experiencing trauma, you take on a little bit of that trauma. Um, and in fact, even myself and going through some of these cases, for example, um, I do this, you know, I do a lot of trauma work for a living. Um, and I know when I read through cases that had to do with children, having kids myself, I actually am a little bit traumatized as well from that. That's a really common, normal, common thing for providers, but it's something that's important to think about and to recognize. So I just wanted to highlight there's many different sorts of interventions for teams, for your teams, for yourself, um, for providers. But one of the main ones that I often think about is debriefing. And I often say, if there's one practice you adopt, this should be it. It doesn't have to be a specific form. There's lots of different forms of debriefing. Um, but the most important things are making people feel safe in their debriefing. So opening, opening a space to be able to talk about a case, opening a space to be able to um, you know, talk about how it impacts you. And some people feel comfortable sharing that. Some people don't. Also, some people feel like they want to debrief a case right after it happens. And some people don't feel impacted as much by it and don't feel like they want to debrief it until, you know, many weeks or months later. So having space sort of over time for that is important, but really making sure that you are inclusive. So sometimes thinking broadly about who the team is, maybe it's just, you know, these providers on the palliative care team, but maybe it's everyone in the hospital and the nurses take care of them. And um, maybe it's a, a much more broader sense of who, who might be experiencing trauma from this um, and really empowering all the members to speak uh, and give feedback freely. And then we won't go into all of these things, but a lot of the talks that I give and trainings I give are around different sorts of interventions for providers. And so I wanted to just include a couple here you can look at more. Um, and I often teach courses with an with a amazing chaplain and psychologist who thinks about a lot of these sort of brief, brief things, right? We don't often have the luxury as providers to sit down and do, you know, hours and hours of things, but how can you do something very small, whether that's something you know, for yourself, providing self-compassion. Um, and one of her interventions that she does that I've picked up is incredibly brief. It's just pausing, putting a hand on your chest and taking a deep breath and saying, 
I am enough. And that's it, that's the whole thing. Um, and it's a, it's a brief moment of self-compassion sometimes doing that in between patients or uh, whenever something is challenging um, is, is all, that, all that you have time for. Um, there's the grounding exercises, a little bit like what I did, sort of having patients feel space, but you can do that for providers. Um, more attention management, so having you shift your focus. So I often do this with patients who are sort of really getting um, elevated and maybe a little bit chaotic, um, but having people shift focus and maybe looking outside, maybe naming things outside, maybe doing things entirely separate for even a brief moment um, can help a huge amount to sort of come back into your space um, or just pausing. So I'll stop there. We'll have space for, for open chatting, um, but first, uh, any questions? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jesse, for such a wonderful presentation. Indeed, the two case studies have really captured um, uh, quite uh, a lot of work that we, we do in the ground. And looking at the comments, even uh, which are coming in, uh, you can see that. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. So can you hear me? Yes, I can. I, okay. I'm seeing the chat too, so I can respond to things as I, I have that up as well. Um, but I see an excellent closing. question. Yeah, thank you. So in, in the chat, uh, I, was, I, was, I think I was unmuted. I was saying thank you so much for the for the presentation and the case studies. And from the chat, as you can see, uh, the response is really showed that uh, these are these, these are scenarios that uh, we experience in our daily day to day uh, caring for patients, and uh, we really learned a lot. So in the chat, uh, the, the questions are coming, not yet, but I have yeah. a question. Uh, I have two questions. So uh, the first one uh, is, for instance, when you've talked to a patient and uh, uh, you try to make them comfortable and all that, and then they make a request which uh, you are not able to, to fulfill. So how do you handle such a situation? In mo most cases, for example, someone says, would you please give me some money? I really need some money to buy some medicine or any other request which um, may, you may not be able to, to present at that moment or to, to fulfill. And that request might be very key for them to even feel settled. So how, how do you handle such? And then the second question is, um, in cases whereby uh, you find that uh, maybe on probing that part of the trauma is an issue that needs uh, legal, uh, uh, legal intervention. What mm -hmm. would you do in such a place? So very quickly, maybe off, off my mind, maybe you find out that maybe in a family, uh, a child has been defiled or anything which really needs uh, legal intervention to stop the cycle. How do, do how should we inter, how should you work in such cases? And yeah, and then maybe I'll just request to stop sharing the screen so that we can see you as you respond. Thank you. Sounds great. Yeah, no, those are excellent questions. Um, I think the the first one, how do you respond to requests that you can't that you can't fulfill? This is so common, right? It's really, really common. Um, and we, you know, especially in palliative care, but everyone in, in healthcare um, just feels often an incredible drive to be able to do everything, provide everything, fix everything, be everywhere. Um, and the reality is that. Um, one, it's it's not possible, right, for us to do that at all. Um, we can't we can't be everywhere in the world. We can't be fixing everywhere everything, um, and that we also need to think about how to take care of ourselves while we're doing that, right? So we we can't give all of our funds away. We can't spend all of our nights. You know, we have to sleep sometime. We can't spend all of our nights up. So first, thinking about that, I need to. If there's something that's taxing me, I need to be well to be able to take care of others, right? I need to take care of myself to be able to take care of others. So first thinking about that aspect of it and then how to actually respond, um, I think is, is very hard as well. Um, and uh, I think I very frequently say, I wish, I wish that I could do that. I use the I wish language a lot. I wish I could help with whatever it may be. 
um, um, but I'm not able to do that right now, or we're not able to do that right now. And the reality is in the healthcare system, this happens all the time, right? Sometimes people, you know, aren't able to access medications at home. So I wish we could set up, you know, IV morphine for this bone pain at home. And I worry that that's not going to be possible. Um, and really being clear about that, um, being clear about what is possible and what isn't possible. Um, I think that honestly, the sharing of it isn't necessarily complicated. Um, it's really the feeling inside that's the hardest portion, right? Coming to terms with ourselves at feeling bad, that we can't fix everything, that we can't make everything better. Um, and trying to, trying to tell ourselves and have compassion for ourselves that we're doing the best that we can and we're doing the most that we can and knowing that we can't fix everything. Um, and I think also kind of coming back to the core element of sitting with trauma, which is recognizing that we aren't able to fix the trauma, right? Ideally, I would go back in time and stop people from experiencing rape and violence and stop people from being sick in the first place and, you know, experiencing accidents and losing their children. And that is not something within my power. It's not something I have power over um, and, and trying to have that be a mantra to remind ourselves of. Those are some answers for that. And then the legal issue as well, um, that's an excellent question, comes up all the time. Um, and, and what I try to do is just have really clear boundaries, you know, for things that have, um, you know, separate needs, really just referring to the right place um, and, and having, you know, whether that could be different systems in different places, um, referring to, to an actual legal organization if we need to do that, to an individual or, or to, you know, noting for patients that they need to sort of access that in that other space. But that's really important. Um, and oftentimes I think of that as um, separate, you know, that's, that's potentially not necessarily sort of whatever I'm doing clinical wise, um, but really trying to keep that separate, but also recognize it's important. Um, it's different responses depending on the situation, obviously. So I won't go into some details about that. And then I also did just see one question earlier, really quickly about what is trauma. So just to kind of answer that. And, and, and I don't know if you have your slide up as well. I think you did a, if you wanted to share that too, there was a great, um, you know, definition. There's multiple different definitions that people use in different settings um, for different indications, but uh and I can, I can also type it in the chat, but oh, the, sure. definition, yeah, I the definition I used was, you know, individual re -tra trauma results from an event or a series of event or a set of circumstances that ex is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening that has lasting adverse effects on an individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. But I can put that in the chat. That sounds great. Yeah. And then I often, I often simplify it as something happened, right? There's an event, something happened. It was bad and it made you feel like you were going to die. It made you feel like your life was threatened. And as a result of that, you have impacts, you have impacts to your mind. You may have impacts to your body. Um, something has stayed with you. Right, something has stayed with you that is making it harder for you to function. That's how I think about it. So that can be so many things, right? That can be um, that can be huge, huge things. It can be war. It can be genocide. It can be um, personal things that just had to do with you. It, it can be can be rape. It can be an, a, a motorcycle accident. Um, it can be a diagnosis. It can be staying in the hospital. Um, it can be, so as I mentioned, you can have vicarious trauma where you're near to someone who you love and that you have trauma by virtue of being close to them. It can be going through the experience um, with someone and having this fear um, of, of them potentially dying, of you potentially dying. Um, but that's really how we think about it. Something happened, it was bad, and it really um, made you feel at risk for your life, life-threatening. And then it's really the after effects of that. And if you can imagine it, that's really common, right? That happens a lot to people all over. Um, and there's entirely other talks for a different time, but um, some people come through those experiences and don't necessarily have trauma um, experiences that are maintained in their bodies. And some people do. And there's lots of different things that sort of cause that. The more powerless you felt during an event, the more likely it is that you might have the long-term effects of trauma. 
Um, but some people are, are able to get to a space where they're able to have a growth mindset in response to the trauma and aren't necessarily as impacted. And we're still learning. We're still learning about how to do, how to change that. You know, how, how do we take care of people in the midst of humanitarian crisis so that they aren't as traumatized? Um, but I think, I think trauma will always be with us. So it's uh, a lot about thinking about how to recognize it and how to intervene. Thank you, and thank you so much, Dr. Jesse. Uh, oh, and I was I'm just going to add outside, oh, outside of like the, you know, definition, it's really just even taking an approach that more often than not, somebody will have experienced trauma, and even just the diagnosis of an illness is traumatic, and that I think was on one of the slides about how we take this trauma-informed approach. Thank you so much, Anne, and uh, she has put in the chat the definition of trauma care, so just check in the chat so that you get the details. Uh, there's a question about uh, care of the carers, but before I go to that, I'd want to highlight some two comments that were given earlier, I think during a discussion. One is a, by Sin Liu, who was talking about uh, the, in the case of the father, that men tend to solve problems. So you need to understand what they really want to solve, uh, to solve and provide for them. And then there was, a, uh, there was another comment by Susan, who was saying that, let a child be a child and let them play. So everyone will feel a bit better. So that just what came into my mind that also as we as we talk to the patients, it's good to be cognizant of their roles in the society, like the roles which they play and how their roles have been affected and help to support that as, as much as possible. Like a child's role is to play, it's part of their, like their life and maybe for men, it's part of their life to solve problems. So thank you so much for those comments. So going back to the question, there was a question here by, um, just a second. Yeah, by Sin Steel, who was saying that, um, could you please uh, share on how we could recharge ourselves? It's about caring for the providers. How could we recharge ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, an excellent, an excellent question. Um, and what I will say is the world of resiliency work, which is sort of how do we take care of ourselves? How do we take care of our teams? How do we take care of each other's um, is, is sort of growing. Um, and I think before we used to think that there's very specific things that we can do to recharge ourselves, right? We have to do meditation, we have to do these sorts of things. And what we're learning more and more in studies is that there actually isn't, there isn't like a set number of things that work for everybody. And in fact, some things are harmful. You know, if you go into a, a group of resident trainees or whatever, and you make them all do meditation, it actually may not, you know, be beneficial for a ton of them. And it may actually be, even be harmful. So the first thing is to ask what recharges you? What, what recharges you? What recharges your team? It may be very different. It may be very different for me versus another provider who I've worked with for, you know, a decade alongside me. We have very different things that recharge us. Um, some of us are recharged by going out and being with people. Um, some of us are recharged by spending more alone time, you know, and reading. Some of us are recharged by um, talking and talking about a case. Some of us are recharged by not talking about it and doing something entirely different, right? Kids are often recharged by playing and, and, and actually changing their attention, just being kids. Um, and that's true for adults too. Um, and so I think that's the most important thing. What will recharge me? What will recharge my team? Maybe different things for you and your team members too. And trying to find space and time for what recharges all those individuals differently. Um, so that is really, really important um, for myself. Um, there's lots of things that recharge me around being with family. Um, I am recharged by debriefing and talking about cases, but I find that I'm actually not interested in doing that right after them. And I actually may be interested in debriefing really hard cases for me, sometimes weeks or months later. You know, I might take care of a really hard patient. And for me, taking care of young mothers with young children is very triggering because of just because I am a young mother um, and I may, I may not feel that impacted initially. And then weeks and months later, I may just be doing something random and then start crying all of a sudden and realize that what I need to do is stop and actually debrief that case with people or do something else to take care of myself, whether that's um, you know, exercise or, or having dinner with friends or whatnot. Um, so that's my, that's my short answer. And then I, I shared some of those things, which I'll share the presentation um, probably through Erin or something they can email, she can email it out. Um, some of those things you can do for providers too. Um, but I do wanna say that it's not one size fits all. It's really, really an individual thing. Thank you so much. Um, that reminds me of another discussion we had once where um, 
we were asking about how the healthcare workers or how we, we cope. And one of them said that when they're stressed, they cope by overworking. So I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> so they go to the laptop and do a lot of work. And so that's their way of, 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 of 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 coping. I don't know how that works, but that is it. <laughs> There's a lot I of think comments. <laughs> it's possible that that's a that's a coping approach for people. Um, it's also <laughs> possible it's a it's a reflex. So it's not necessarily coping, right? It's doing something that's a reflex that we do when things are hard, which can sometimes be harmful, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. the thing that we do to quote unquote cope is to actually hurt ourselves more, right? So for instance, some people will cope by eating and eating and eating and gaining and gaining and gaining, we might not think of that as a healthy coping approach, but it's a thing we do when something is hard. So sometimes separating out, I love your question, what recharges us, what actually helps us versus what do we just go to because it's something that we, that we do when something's hard and to try to think about, is this something that's helping me? Is it re helping me recharge? Or is it actually something that I'm doing as a reflex that's actually hurting me more? And only you can answer that for yourself. That's very individual. Oh, wow, that's that's a, I think that's a really good thing for us to think through, to think uh, whether is it a recharging or is it a coping mechanism? Because recharging usually is positive. And I also like another comment here, which uh, it was about trauma by Susan, say that whatever the patient thinks is trauma is trauma. And that cuts across so many things. Like in palliative care, we talk about pain. We say pain is personalized. And what, when, whenever the patient say that they have pain, even if you see like physically, they don't look like they have pain, that is pain. So we've also learned today that trauma is also personalized. So if the patient says that they have trauma, even if you think they may not have, then they have, maybe it's just up to us to explore more and find the kind of trauma that they, they have. So uh, just looking to the comments, we have about two, three minutes to finish. Thank you so much, you've been quite, uh, a good uh, participants have had quite a lot of learning. Uh, just comments, uh, thank you. There's a lot of thank you and well done to our presenter and Anne, Anne and uh, Dr. Jesse. And Anne has given, I think, a last comment here that we could have an entire session on self-care. So it's quite a big, big session. And we also like the word frame, bouncing forward, which helps you to move forward in, in this work. So it's really been quite a good session. I, I'm not seeing any other question. Any other uh, question which you could go through as as I wait for the last last question and just before I, I, I give maybe the final remarks to our presenters for maybe a minute each, just want to mention that uh, next week we are having a very another uh, session which is going to be about breaking bad news. So that's just going to be going to build on today. You've had someone who has trauma, then you maybe you have another more bad news. How do you break that bad news to the patient? So we really look forward to having you there. So before we close, um, I just want to give a minute each to uh, Anne and to Dr. Jesse for the last remarks, and then we'll close. Thank you. Did you want to go first? I'm happy to. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to um, thank you guys all for being amazing at participating today. Um, and just that I think this is a really you know, in some ways, this is a new topic, right? Like, we don't really talk about this as much. And also, it is very clear that this is a topic that all of you guys are experiencing, right? We just maybe didn't have words for it. We didn't have ways of talking about it. But you guys are all incredibly experienced in taking care of patients mm -hmm. with trauma. You already are. This is not new in that, in that it's already something you're doing. But putting some language to it, putting some words, thinking about how to approach it, I think can make us feel less powerless as providers. I often feel the most powerless when I'm taking care of a patient with trauma because I'm sort of at a loss of what to do. All my pain medications aren't working. Um, and this is, is in part to empower us. And then I also just want to highlight um, how important, again, it is to really think about taking care of ourselves and our team in this situation. And it's exactly right. We could have an entire other session. And in fact, I do do entire sessions and workshops on self-care and that that is just such an important thing to pair with this um, because this work is hard. This work is in fact traumatizing for us um, and to really have that at the forefront of our mind and doing this work too. And I'm back in a couple of weeks talking about grief and spirituality and some other things. So I'm super excited to see you guys then too. Thank you so much, Dr. Jesse. Uh, over to Anne Kelema, your last remarks. 
Yeah, thank you all. This was really just a great discussion and there were just lots of valuable stuff in the chat. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, as we close out, I think there's just, yeah, ways of um, making sure that you're taking care of yourself in this work and knowing that showing up and being present is really the best thing that you can do for the patients that you're taking care of. So thank you all. I think I'm back in a few weeks too. <laughs> it was great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for the last remark. Let us show up and let us be present at our work and also in the next session when we'll be talking about uh, breaking bad news. We have a few sessions. We are finishing by the end of the July. So a bit about four or five. So we look forward to meeting you in the next session. Have a good morning, good evening, good night. And thank you so much for your time. Bye. Bye. Oh, Bye. 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 Bye.